about today. What I'm going to speak on is actually um, derived from uh, the last uh, book project Nora mentioned, um, the Outlaw Territories book, and I don't know if any of you had a chance to read the, uh, the reading I sent out, but it's another chapter of the same project. It will become another chapter of the same project. And I can certainly talk to the larger scope of that um, book a little bit later, uh, but it, uh, the sort of general project is uh, to look at this intersection of, of architecture with what I'm uh, calling sort of territorial insecurity and human unsettlement. And this is going to take... Um, uh, very different valences across the uh, the different chapters, and uh, I also wanted to mention before I begin that well, I'm an architectural historian, uh, as Nora mentioned. Um, what I'm going to speak on will um, uh, depart quite significantly from what you might imagine to be a topic of architectural history, uh, but I'm hoping it will do so in a way that. Um, uh, that offers uh, some conceptual terms for thinking about architecture's involvement in uh, in techniques of power and, as I mentioned before, in questions uh, of territorial insecurity and, and human unsettlement. And uh, actually, so this, what I present today, I should say, this is like the opening chapter um, and the book project goes from uh, the sort of identifications with informality uh, all the way to... Um, uh, U.S. Department of Defense funded architectural research projects that were uh, geared towards, uh, in effect, they were they were technically counterinsurgency projects that were funded by the military um, uh, in regard to Latin American and um, Southeast Asian um, insurgencies. But in fact, the the U.S. government also imagined that they were technologies that would be able to be um, uh, used in the U.S in cities basically against African American populations. So this was also the historical context was a sort of fear of, uh, of black people in effect in, in the United States and uh, so very sort of disturbing um, um, projects for architects to be involved with and so this is the sort of broader scope, it's quite heterogeneous. Um, you'll see at various parts of what I'm going to present some of the rhetoric of camps. I'm not speaking on camps as such. I'm talking about, a, you know, quite um, um, ambiguous, and I'm hoping the ambiguity of my reading of this material will come out in my presentation. Uh, ambiguous identification um, down, yeah, like uh, in terms of sociocultural and sociopolitical um, rights, uh, people that tried to in, a, to, in effect, adopt this position of voluntary primitivism, and I'll unpack what that means um, and why I think it's uh, important uh, to look at. But I did want to say that this is a, even though while well, at times I'm going to find um, what I think are interesting critical and political stakes um, um, being put forward, by the characters that I'm going to talk on at other times, their ideas are really uh, politically unfathomable. And, and so I'm going to go back and forth. You'll see uh, moments where it seems they're quite enlightened, other moments when what they're doing is incredibly problematic. So I hope that is, um, uh, is clear. Um, and I say that also to insist that this is not, not putting forward a model um, or anything that can be recuperated. It's a historical phenomena that I think has really... Um, important political ramifications to, to consider and conceptualize and, and understand. Okay, so to begin. Uh, in June 1970, Sarah Davidson, uh, she's a journalist, published the story of her encounter with the open land movement in Harper's Bazaar. Entitled Open Land, as you see, Getting Back to the Communal Garden, the article recounted the journalist's recent visits to Wheeler's Ranch in Northern California and Freedom Farm in the state of Washington, along with a brief conversation with Stuart Brand, uh, a sort of legendary editor uh, of a catalytic uh, piece of media infrastructure here, uh, the Whole Earth Catalog. Davidson's article is of interest here for its focus on battles over open land, on attempts to cede private property rights to a largely undefined domain of communal stewardship, to make land available rent-free for anyone to use, not just in California and the Pacific Northwest, but eventually nationally and even globally. Such attempts, as I want to trace here, would meet a rapid and increasingly violent response by the state. 
Offering her impressions of Wheeler's Ranch, Davidson recalled that there was a sign near the community garden reading, Permit Not Required to Settle Here. Many had taken up the call to occupy land free of charge, building makeshift structures or setting up temporary dwellings from tents and teepees to customized school buses and vans within this ambiguous territorial zone. The dwellings, David wrote, of the scene she encountered are straight out of dog patch. Old, board, old boards nailed unevenly together, odd pieces of plastic strung across poles to make wobbly igloos with round stovepipes poking out the side. Most have dirt floors, though the better ones have wood. The occupants themselves had a similarly poverty-ridden, even pre-industrial, if slightly theatrical or even sort of fictional appearance, wearing, as she put it, hillbilly clothes with funny hats and sashes, outfits she also described as pioneer clothes. The scene in the patchwork-like garden, she went on to suggest, presents the image of a 19th century tableau. Women in long skirts and shawls, men in lace-up boots, coveralls and patched jeans tied with pieces of rope, sitting on the grass playing banjos, guitars, lyres, uh, wood flutes, dulcimers and an accordion. In a field to the right are the community animals, chickens, cows, goats, donkeys and horses. So emerging from a society which has long placed a premium on social and technological modernity, whether in agriculture and land management practices, housing techniques, clothing habits, forms of sociability, consumption and entertainment, or even standards of hygiene, how, I want to ask, are we to understand this peculiar and willing regression, that's a term they use, this identification that ran so clearly against the grain of American ideals of progress? Wheelers was not alone in adopting such anachronistic and seemingly vernacular customs and aesthetic trappings, or in adopting an ethos of communal property and minimal exploitation of resources. These practices were characteristic of many back-to-the-land pioneers and have typically been read as manifestations of an escapist desire to return to simpler modes of existence or simply romantic searches for a life more meaningful than the spiritual void characteristic of their parents' generation. Generation. So you have to think of, uh, you know, consumer society booming in the U.S. with people, um, uh, uh, you know, very much focused on purchasing refrigerators and cars. So if these widespread sentiments were important motivating factors in returning to the land, I want to suggest that one might revisit the critical and political valence of this movement by reading open land as a symptomatic but tactical response to historical forces at work as a form of counterconduct, which wittingly or unwittingly articulated a form of knowledge about an engagement with contemporaneous techniques of power. At a moment once again marked by the legacy of US-led imperial warfare on foreign territory, a seemingly ever-increasing range and reach of social and political regulation under the auspice of security, security both of territory and of populations, widespread concerns over the environment and exploitation of natural resources, and struggle against the imminent foreclosure of any remaining global commons or public domain, from land, air and sea now to, to the digital realm, these historical modes of counterconduct warrant revisiting, not at all to stress in the sense of providing contemporary models of refusal or dissidence, but as sites through which to investigate architectures relation to these emergent techniques of power. So exodus from official systems of managing land and the built environment, from property rights and trespass laws to building codes and health and safety regulations was not as soon demonstrated at Wheeler's, as easy as declaring permanent not, uh, sorry, uh, permit not required to settle here. The sign served less as a performative or speech act in the sense theorized by J.L. Austin, a literary theorist, of actually declaring the land to be free of the need for permits, than it did as a polemical and political gesture. It was at once a call for freeing the land or ceding it back to the commons and an invitation to participate in testing the limits of the police and legal system's tolerance for the communal battles against private ownership of land and their unconventional behavior. And the local authorities, uh, as you'll see, uh, very quickly fought back, giving rise to what came to be known as code wars, and with them an escalating set of tactical and counter-tactical maneuvers between the commune and local and state governing institutions.
During this battle, these ad hoc shelters and these non-normative structures, and, and we can't, of course, quite call this architecture, I'll come back to this later, um, emerged as key components of this refusal of normative modes of life. If these low-tech structures proved to be powerful weaponry on the part of the communards, easy to produce, affordable, and garnering both anxiety, anxiety and publicity, they proved insufficient against the laws regulating human habitation, which quickly came in to replace the initial charge of harboring dangerous persons as the police and legal system's most effective ammunition. Davidson ended her account of Wheeler's by recounting that she had accompanied commune members to a court appearance for charges of assaulting a policeman uh, when a squad came to the ranch looking for juvenile runaways and army deserters. Although the judge had declared a mistrial in this instance, she noted, the county fathers are not finished though. They are still attempting to close access to the road to Wheeler's and to get an injunction to raise, you know, to, to destroy all the buildings on the ranch as health hazards. County officials would eventually triumph on both fronts, with the exception of Wheeler's studio that you see on the bottom right here, uh, and this was protected as private property actually, unlike the other buildings. All buildings were later demolished and the access road closed to all but Wheeler and his family, so that sort of normalcy of, of occupation was uh, enforced. Willis Ranch was not the first property in California to have opened its land to those wishing to depart from urban life and join an alternative rural community. Nor was it the first uh, to have elicited, elicited this type of response from the law uh, and from the judiciary system. When Bill Willer opened his 320-acre property in 1967 to whoever want, uh, wanted to settle there, he did so partially in response to the rapid foreclosure of Morningstar Ranch, an earlier attempt uh, to what they understood as a sort of forging a liberated territory uh, within the United States. In spring of 1966, Lou Gottlieb and Raymond Sender had declared this ranch to be open land, a place without rules, regulations, or organization. In a sympathetic article on Morningstar and what they called it, its happiness people, Gottlieb was described as a patriarch who doesn't govern, a landlord who doesn't charge. Morningstar was to be a utopia of the non-governed, a non-hierarchical community, a place that sought to exist beyond the domain of patriarchs and landlords, as well as that of extant social and material norms. Uh, Gottlieb was a, a former singer with the Limelighters, a, a famous band uh, from California, uh, and Ramon Sender had been uh, an important um, figure within the early development of electronic music and, and synthesizers uh, in San Francisco. Uh, the two of them, just for some context, had le met at this legendary Trips Festival uh, in late 1966. Uh, Sender was a principal organizer of, of this festival. It was a sort of three-day LSD-fueled experimentation uh, with overcoming the, the ego, you know, the person, through alternative consciousness and electronic environments. Yeah. So if there were um, mainly, let's say, people from certain class, yeah, yeah, yeah. class or yeah. Uh, ethnicity, I mean, how yeah. they were formed and who were yeah. like, somehow it were leaders. Yeah, and yeah. Now they lost a little bit more about the, yeah. the formation of the community. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll come back to that. But um, um, uh, so the the community, yeah, you know, it's literally sort of announced, um, announced among um, uh, the famous group called the Diggers in San Francisco in the 1960s, who gave free food and uh, free entertainment in Haight Ashbury, in a famous center of, of counterculture in the U.S. And um, so they announced that their land was open. And so that elicited people. They were almost all educated white middle class people, not entirely, um, but this was the main contingent, yeah? Um, uh, people that came from privilege and chose to um, give it away, yeah? There were some rural people who joined them, largely like teenagers, and this is why the police were coming looking for juvenile deserters, uh, looking for children uh, who had joined them. And, um, and they were trying to use this as a way of closing it down. So, um, but invariably there, yeah, they were college educated, um, yeah, yeah. So also, uh, you know, really key problematic here. Uh, in, it's not that they, well, it's complicated. Not that they didn't welcome other people. They did, actually, but the racial politics are really, really interesting. Um, and there's a lot of narratives um, about disrupting the integral community you know, 
uh, around certain types of political issues that they didn't care for? It's a really interesting question. Um, but the, the um, you know, this is this uh, famous sort of migration west, migration toward California and the Pacific Northwest from people uh, from New York and Boston. And so this is the main group of people that were coming out, yeah, to escape what they, yeah, does so that answer your question? Yeah, that's, that's who they were, yeah. Um, uh, so, just, so I, you know, I point out the relation to the Trips Festival and the electronic music culture um, uh, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, uh, many figures within the counterculture attested that, that LSD, that acid, this drug, had played a significant role in sponsoring their rejection of mainstream values uh, and a sense of sort of oneness with the earth and, and its people. But perhaps more importantly here, Morning Star, um, the commune, remain very haunted by the sense that, that electronic technologies uh, and the, the advance of computerization um, heralded a future of pure automation, a future in which human labor would be rendered unnecessary uh, by advanced machines. Uh, and to quote, the people here, Gottlieb remarked to a journalist uh, while he was touring uh, what they called the primitive houses, are the first wave of an ocean of technological unemployables. The cybernation, he said, is in its early snowball stages. So that human labor would become outmoded on account of, of computers, harbored on the one hand a utopian promise, that of, of freedom from work uh, and supposedly freedom from scarcity. And in retrospect, this embrace of manual labor, of hand-built houses, of farm farming the land, uh, of doing it yourself, reads as a compensatory shift away from that very technology, from, that, from the computer, a largely unselfconscious, if for many, therapeutic attempt to deal with the prospect of the withdrawal of material activities for the first generation for whom this shift toward the vicissitudes of what we call immaterial labor was not only imminent but, but palpable. But on the other hand was the recognition of dystopian underside heralded by the same technologies, uh, so not only the, the, the loss of work, um, but also the, the fear of atomic and nuclear warfare that was haunting uh, this entire generation, this, this idea that um, if atomic warfare happened, everybody would be reduced to this type of basic survival, there, that everybody in effect would become forced into uh, this type of, of primitive state. Um, so they're, uh, you know, quite literally set up these, these communes as a sort of testing ground for what life might be like um, after, after modern technology. So here also we can say in a, in a strange sort of distorted reiteration of the radical ruptures in and the uh, unjust adjacencies emerging in global access to technology and the shifting topology. So what we're finding, you know, what I'm trying to suggest, what we're trying to find is a, a type of voluntary attempt to um, uh, test out test out a position uh, which is typically an unjust position. But as Alessandro asked, yeah, these people are, are in effect bringing it upon themselves. So if voluntary for those living within an economy of abundance, for many others, whether the poorer sector of the American populace or those rapidly industrial areas of the so-called third world, including countries recently gaining independence from colonial rule and increasingly becoming industrial labor pools, this type of primitivism was, of course, hardly voluntary, raising the question of how we're to read this type of identification down, whether to poor farmers, to itinerant populations, to Native Americans, to the 19th century, or even to survivors of a nuclear apocalypse. Mm -hmm.